If you're looking to set up a new Home Assistant installation, this is the video for you. Now I've found two problems with most of the videos out there, and that is, number one, they get stale really quickly. And that's because there's so many people that are constantly changing this platform that if you're looking at a video from a year ago, chances are your experience is gonna be different than what you saw in that video. The second issue is that the videos tend to be very focused on a specific topic. And it's hard for a newbie to understand what to watch first and what order do I need to do things. And you spend hours and hours and get frustrated. And believe me, I know, <laughs> I spent hours on this several times over the past year and I bailed on it, bailed on it. So this time I'm committed. I'm gonna go through it and set up my own Home Assistant instance. And I want you to come along and that way you will understand how it's done from start to finish. This will be a long video, and I will put chapter time codes down in the video description so you can skip anything that's not applicable to you. Okay, let's get to it. All right, let's talk about installation on a Raspberry Pi. It is really pretty simple. I'm here on the Home Assistant website. If you go to documentation and installation, you can see there's a whole bunch of different methods that it supports installation on. But I really like using the Home Assistant operating system and installing it on a dedicated computer. And that could be as simple as a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi. So if you want to go the Raspberry Pi route, I will warn you, they are hard to get. Not impossible, but hard. And there's a big secondary market and people are jacking up the prices. But if you want to get one at the list price, which is around $35 for a Raspberry Pi, I suggest you get to know rpilocator.com. That's this website you see here behind me. And uh, here you can see, if you go to this every day, it shows you various different pies that are available and where they are being sold. And they even provide links you can get to each one of them. Now, it's really tough in the US. So if you're in the US, you're gonna have a hard time. But I did it. I sat here and I waited until I saw one that was available at Adafruit. This is the one that I bought. It's a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B. Now this one is from 2015, but I assure you it still works great and uh, it works fine for Home Assistant too. You're also gonna need your power supply with a micro USB on it. This one happens to be two and a half amps. You also need a, an SD card. And the SD card just installs right here. And um, this is the part that is almost like magic. All you're gonna do is pop this in. This is my little card reader here in my computer. And we say we wanna install this on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, it gives you suggested hardware, things like that. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna burn on that SD card. You're gonna install the operating system, Home Assistant operating system on that SD card. Now, if you click this link here, it actually takes you to the page to download Etcher. Now, depending upon the Raspberry Pi that you're using, there's a different URL here. So I'm gonna copy this one for the Raspberry Pi 3. Just gonna copy that, or you can click this little button here. And then I'm gonna say flash from URL. And just make sure that's the right one there. Okay, and here you can see my 256 gigabyte SD card. I'm gonna select that and just say flash. It is going to overwrite, so I'm going to say yes, I'm sure. And I need to put in my password. All right, now I had this situation before. I'm using a Mac, and so this, for some reason, doesn't like doing the URL. So what I'm gonna do is take this file, this, this name, and I'm gonna put it up here, and it downloads it automatically to my downloads folder. Then I'm gonna say flash from file, and this is the one that I want, rpi3. I'm gonna select my target. Yes, I'm sure. And now it should work. 
Okay, and when it's done, you can see that it says the disk that it is inserted is not readable by this computer. That's normal because it is not a Mac file. So I'm going to eject it. Okay, now I'm just going to take the SD card, pop it in here. I'm going to plug in my power. And then, of course, I need a network cable. And then I'm just going to plug this in over here. And here you can see the little flashy lights that give an indication that it's on and active. That's what the green light means, it's activity. And you should also see the network light is blinking as well. Okay, at this point I've flashed it and started up the Pi and it says you can go to homeassistant.local colon 18123 and uh, just wait for that to come up. And I'll just keep clicking reload until it does. And there it is. Literally, that was it. I didn't, I didn't pause it. So you can see it says it takes up to 20 minutes for this to uh, do its initialization. And I'll be back. Now, although you can use a Raspberry Pi as the computer for your Home Assistant installation, I don't think you should. I really think the best approach is to use an, what they call an x86 computer. This is a computer that has an Intel chip in it. Sometimes you'll see them as Intel Nooks. And this happens to be an N5 Celeron processor that's in this, which is way faster than the Raspberry Pi, and it's not that expensive. In fact, this entire machine uh, with the power supply was $169. And it came with a 256 gigabyte SSD and eight gig of RAM. I'll put a link to it down in the video description. It's really a nice, simple machine that, uh, that works really well for Home Assistant. Now there's two ways to get Home Assistant on this machine. And I'm gonna go through both of them right now. So the first, and, and honestly, you're going to need a spare monitor and keyboard and mouse to plug into it because you're going to need to boot into the BIOS. So I happen to have a mouse and I happen to have a keyboard. Whoops, sorry, hit my microphone. So the first thing you're going to need to do is get yourself a flash drive that you can put Ubuntu on. And that's because we're going to use this to boot Ubuntu on this computer. And then we're gonna we're gonna use Etcher <laughs> to burn Home Assistant on this computer. Now this is the harder process. I'm gonna go through an easier process after this, but this one is free. Other than the cost of the jump drive, you know, the the flash drive, um, this process is free. But if you want to save time, I'll show you another way. So let me just take a moment and plug these things in here. All right, so I'm gonna take my. Ubuntu, and I'm going to plug it in the front. And I've got my keyboard and mouse plugged in the back, and now I'm just going to power this on. And I'm going to immediately start pressing F7 on here. It would help if I plugged in the HDMI port. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Setup. And in the setup here is where I've got a couple of things I need to check on. The first is security. And for secure boot, I need that disabled. Okay? That's number one. And the number two is for the boot, you need to have the uh, UEFI boot working here. Save changes and reset. Okay, at this point, I don't know if you can see it, but hopefully you can see that it says try or install Ubuntu. Okay, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to click enter. And here it is booting Ubuntu. And this is going to take a bit, so I'll be back. Alrighty, so you can see it has booted Ubuntu. And you don't want to say install Ubuntu, you want to say try Ubuntu. Okay. 
And with this, I'm gonna come here. All right, I'm gonna actually go to my website, handydad.tv slash H-A-O-S dash Ubuntu. We're having trouble finding that site. Why? It would help if I plugged in my network cable. Okay, so this is my page on my website, and these are the commands that we're going to execute. And to execute those commands, we're going to go to a terminal. So let's find terminal. There we go. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take each one of those commands, and I'm going to copy them and paste them over. Hopefully you can see that better. Now, you can type these, but I'm lazy, so I'm just pasting them in. Okay, at this point, Belina Etcher should be installed. So the one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here to Home Assistant. .io, and I'm gonna go back to that page so I can get to that I'm going to come in here where it says generic x86-64. And in here, it gives you all the, the boot mode, disable secure boot, and right now I am following this, uh, how to use it, a live operating system on a USB drive. That's this step right here. This is what I'm following. And so at this point, I'm going to be able to run Belina Etcher on here. And there it is. And I need the URL, which is right here. Copy that. And I'm going to flash from URL, paste in that URL. And now when I select target, it's going to select, I'm going to say show hidden, because this is the SSD installed. And I'm going to do that, and this is where the system drive is. So it's giving me an extra warning here, because it basically says, hey, you're overwriting the operating system that came with that machine. And I know that, and I'm saying yes, I want to do that. So yes, I'm sure. And now it is writing. Okay, that is done. Now I'm going to come over here to tell it to power off. All right, it says please remove the installation media and then press enter. So I'm going to pull that, hit enter, and now it should power off. Okay. Now with Ubuntu removed, I should be able to power it on. And here you can see Home Assistant because I still have the, uh, the monitor hooked up. Normally you don't see this. You don't need a monitor at all to run Home Assistant. All right, so that's, that's the first method on how you can create a bootable x86 computer with Home Assistant. Now I'm gonna show you an easier approach, but it costs a little bit of money. Okay. This process involves going inside. And what you have here is this is the SSD. That's the basically the, uh, the hard drive. And this is the eight gig of RAM that's in here. So what I'm gonna do is actually remove this and we're gonna burn or we're gonna etch the Home Assistant operating system directly on this drive. That's how we're gonna do it. And to do that, we're gonna use this little gizmo right here, which I think I bought for about $17. And, um, but it simplifies this process so much easier, I gotta tell you. All I'm gonna do is, let's see, take this out. And then 
all I do is pop it in here. Okay, that's it. And then that can plug in here. All right, so this is the URL for the generic x8664, right? I'm gonna copy that, open a new tab, put that in there, and it is gonna download that image file. Then I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna say flash from file and pick that file that I just downloaded. And my target is gonna be my 256 gigabyte SSD card. And I'm gonna say flash. Yes, I'm sure. I just have to put in my password here. And now it is flashing. Y you gotta admit that is so much easier than doing that whole rigmarole with Ubuntu. It just means you have to pay an extra $17 for that little gizmo. What's your time worth? That's really what it comes down to. And now you can see the light has gone off here. I can unplug this. Pop it back in here. And then pop this back on as well. All right, at this point, it is done with its preliminary boot up, whatever it is, and I'm gonna create a user account for myself. And I'm also going to detect my location. And that is, it's a quick way for it to select what country you're in, and I use US customary and US dollars, you know, so this is gonna be Fahrenheit, all my, all my temperature and whatnot is gonna be in Fahrenheit. So I really recommend that. And I don't usually check any of these things. And it already found some things on my network, but uh, that's okay, I'm gonna ignore that for now. All right, and this is it. We're into uh, Home Assistant. All right, now if I click on my name down here, my user account, this gives any kind of preferences for my specific account. You can see by default I have it here as dark. I can also change it to light. So if yours starts up and you're in light mode, you can come in and change it to dark mode. It's all a matter of preference. The other thing I recommend is clicking advanced mode. That unlocks some additional features that um, do come in handy. And that's it. When you first come into Home Assistant, this is your dashboard, which is the, it just says overview. And there's just your user account. There's a tab for that. And there's also a, um, a widget here for your forecast, weather forecast that is. And any other devices that you wanna add to your dashboard will get added here. We'll talk about dashboards a little bit later, but for now, uh, let me just give you a quick overview. One of the most popular things you're gonna do when you first boot up Home Assistant and get started is you're gonna go into settings. And within settings, you've got devices and services. And this is where you're gonna see all those integrations that it, it discovered from the get-go. Anything that Home Assistant finds on your network, it will automatically add and show up in here. Now, you still have to configure it, but it detects, like it knows that I have a Rachio sprinkler uh, control, okay? I could set that up right now. It knows that there's a Lutron Caseta hub on my network, and it knows that I have Tuya devices. So I could, if I wanted to, set these things up right now, but I don't want to. I'm gonna do things my way. What's important to me is Z-Wave and Zigbee. So first I'm gonna set up Z-Wave. Now, regardless of what you're going to set up, whether it be Z-Wave or Zigbee, or anything else for that matter, it's gonna communicate usually through some kind of a radio transmitter that works with that specific protocol. So for example, this one here I have is a Z-Wave stick. This is an AOTech Z-Wave Z-Stick, and it's a Gen 5. They also, I think they're up to Gen 7, if not 
greater by now, but I've had this one for a while. Now I have also, I've done the research and I know that this device is compatible with Home Assistant. So that's one way to ensure success is to make sure if you are gonna purchase a Z-Wave connection or a Zigbee connection, you know, whatever those dongles are, you wanna make sure you find ones that are supported. So all I'm gonna do at this point, I'm gonna put this one in the front USB. And then this stick, you can just see these lights on here. They just, um, they just cycle through. That's just the way this stick is. I ignore them at this point. Now I'm gonna switch back to the desktop here. And right off the bat, you can see it discovered this device, TTY ACM0, is actually the device name on my computer there. And so it knows it's a Z-Wave stick and it's asking me, do I wanna configure this? So I'm gonna say yes. And it's just gonna confirm and I'm gonna say submit. At this point, I'm gonna leave these blank. And that's it. Now it says the Z stick is set up and it's asking me what area it's in. I can put it in an area if I want. I can just say, all right, I'm gonna add a new area and I'm gonna call this one office. Not that it really matters, but you can set things up in your house with specific areas. Okay, now to demonstrate the setup of a Z-Wave device, I have here a Z-Wave smart plug. This is an AOTech Smart Switch 6. I'm sure there's a newer version of that, but it's pretty straightforward. All I'm gonna do is plug it in. And you can see the colors rotate. That indicates that it is not connected to a network at this point. And so then I'm gonna to come to my desktop and I'm gonna go into my Z-Wave configuration and I'm gonna click add a device. And it says it's searching for Z-Wave devices. And over here, all I'm gonna do is click the power button and it does that blinky blink. And over on the screen, it says, the device has been added. Now when I go to devices, you can see I have the smart switch here. And the smart switch has, you can hear that little click. And I'll put it here. In fact, I will help make it a little easier to see. I'm gonna plug that in there, flip the switch here, and you can see how quickly I'm clicking the mouse and it's going on pretty much instantaneously. Okay, I'm flipping this switch right here. That's what's doing it. All right, so that is the setup of my Z-Wave device. All right, let me show you how to remove a Z-Wave device. If I come into the configuration page here, you can see this button that says remove device. And when I start the exclusion mode, I then just have to push that same button on my, uh, my light here. And it will go back to, let me pull this up. You see how it is circling those colors again. And that is how you do it. It is no longer there. When I go to devices, it is no longer there. So that's how you do Z-Wave. All right, the next thing I wanna do is put in my Sonoff Zigbee. This is a Zigbee 3.0 dongle. And this is the Zigbee 3.0 dongle plus. All right, there's a couple versions of this, but the plus is the older version and this one is more compatible. It's not like the new one is not compatible, but it's this one is more compatible. So I'm gonna plug this into my USB in the back, and then I'm gonna switch over to the screen, and let's go into our devices and services, and in here, you'll see it discovered that dongle. So all I have to do is click configure, and it says you wanna set this up, and I'm gonna say yes. Now, this is a clear example of some functionality that has gotten much better over time because I don't need to know anything about what 
the device name is and what the path is and I don't need to touch YAML at all. Everything was done through the user interface. So at this point, uh, network formation, choose the network. Okay, I'm just going to leave it as erase network settings and create a new network. And that's fine. Now this is called Zigbee Home Automation. This is the one that's built right into Home Assistant. There is also a popular alternative that was developed by a third party. It is open source, so it is freely available. It's called Zigbee to MQTT. Now that involves setting up a Mosquito MQTT broker and the process is a little bit more complicated. You also have to go to the add-on store, and, and we haven't talked about add-ons yet, but you have to pull that down as an add-on. It does not happen automatically. Why would people do it? Well, from what I understand, there are some limitations with the ZHA, the, the Zigbee Home Assistant and integration, that the built-in Zigbee is not as, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't allow as much flexibility as Zigbee to MT, MQTT. So if you use ZHA by default is what I would say. If for some reason one of your devices is not compatible or there are capabilities of the device that maybe are not showing up. So for example, if you have a multi-sensor and you don't see the light settings, maybe that's something that Zigbee to MQTT can help you with. But they're mutually exclusive. You're not going to have both. So if you want to use that, you can do that. Just um, make sure you delete the ZHA first. So I'm going to say the same thing, put that one in the office and finish. Now let's talk about setting that up. So here I have a Zigbee smart plug. This is a third reality. And I'm just going to plug this in over here. And let's see how we can set that up too. Now I'm going to come into configure and I'm going to say add device and it's searching for Zigbee devices. Now this one, I don't know if you can see it, but the light on here, there's a little light on here that was blinking rapidly when I first plugged it in. And because I was in pairing mode, it found it and it already paired it in. See, it says device is regularly ready to use. Now I can put this in an area if I want, or I can ignore it. And I don't know how long this keeps searching for Zigbee devices, but you can add multiple devices here. Regardless, I'm going to go back to my device list. And here I can see my third reality. And you can hear the click. I'll plug in my little light bulb here. And just like before, click, it goes on and off really quickly. Figure out how would we remove a Zigbee device. And this is a little bit different. I'm going to go into devices. And in here, when I say remove, it will remove it from the Zigbee network too. I don't have to put it into exclusion mode. So I say yes, it's gone, and I unplug it right away. Because otherwise, it will onboard it again. <laughs> there you go, full circle. How to add Zigbee devices and how to remove them. Okay, now what I've done is I've brought back both of those devices, my Z-Wave devices. This one is the Zigbee, and this one is the Z-Wave. And that way you could tell that they're both working. And I have another device that I'm going to set up here. This is called, I know it's a little dark, but uh, here, I'll hold it up. This is called an AOTech Walmote Quad. It is a Z-Wave device, wireless, obviously, but it's rechargeable as well. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to go into my Z-Wave and say, add a device. And then I'm going to push, there's a little button on the back of it. I'm just going to push that little button and the light's going to blink and you can see it is adding that device. Now I'm doing this because I want to talk about automations. And with these, I can now work on various automations in my network.
Now the way this works is there are four quadrants on it here. That's why they call it a wall moat quad. And uh, I labeled them one, two, three, and four. And I'm gonna make it so that when I press button one, it turns on the Zigbee bulb. And when I turn uh, button two, I'm gonna press button two and it's gonna control the other bulb, the, um, the Z-Wave smart plug. So how would I go about doing that? Well, I'm gonna go into settings automations and scenes and I'm going to create an automation the trigger is going to be a device and I'm going to find my wall moat quad and I'm going to say when it creates the action on scene one key pressed and then I'm gonna say, control a device. And let's pick which device I'm talking about here. I said that was gonna be the Zigbee switch. And here I'm just gonna say, toggle it. And save that. And I'm gonna call this button one. All right, now let's give it a try. I click button number one and the light goes on. Click it again, it goes off. Now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna fast forward, do the same thing for button number two. Now when I press button number two, you can see it toggles the second light. First light, second light. Now let's go crazy and let's do button number three turns both of them on. Now for the next automation, I'm gonna use a scene, and the scene is going to be a combination of both of those lights. So let's go back to settings, and I'm gonna go into automations and scenes, and in here, I'm gonna add a scene, and I'm gonna call this scene both lights. And the devices that I'm gonna put in here are my third reality, switch, that's the Z-Wave switch, and my smart switch six. And that's it. Okay, save that. And then I'm going to say I want this to be on. And then I want this to be on. Okay. So this is going to be both lights on. Save that. Okay. Then I'm gonna duplicate this and say both lights off. And I'm gonna save that. So if I click both lights on, they go on. And both lights off, they obviously are off. Okay, now let's do an automation here. We're gonna create a new one. The trigger is going to be, guess what? My wall moat, button three. Now button three puts both of them on, but it doesn't toggle them. So here's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna then create another one for button four. Okay, button four is going to activate the scene called both lights off. And they're off. On, off. Or I can control them individually. That's how you do scenes and automations. Now remember, scenes can't be toggled because if these were light bulbs that had varying brightness, I could set a scene for watching TV or watching a movie or cooking. You can have a scene that has a bunch of, bunch of uh, different devices in it and you can set their settings, whether it be color, brightness, anything like that. And you can use anything to trigger those scenes. This is a, a button that I'm pressing, but that could also be a motion sensor or something like that. So that's how you do scenes and automations.
All right, the next thing I want to talk about is add-ons. Now, add-ons are one of the most powerful features of Home Assistant, in my opinion. And they are basically, they make it an extendable platform that other people can develop extensions, things that, you know, it works in ways that it wasn't intended for and just greater capabilities. And these things are just, they're made to be plugged in to Home Assistant. And so it's a really great platform for developers and whatnot that, that want to, you know, do something special. So anyway, let's look at um, the add-ons. So you get to the add-ons from the settings menu. And here you can see the fifth one down is add-ons. Now the only add-on I have in there at this point is the Z-Wave JS add-on. And if you recall, that was installed automatically from when I when it detected my Z-Wave Z-Stick was inserted. So I didn't have to do that, but there is an add-on store. You can see this button down here for the add-on store. And there's a whole bunch of add-ons that are here out of the box that you can choose from. Now, if you see a smaller list on your installation, what you need to do is come over to your profile here and down here is advanced mode. You have to make sure you have advanced mode on and that will unlock a whole bunch of additional add-ons that, um, that you wouldn't see without that checked. Okay, so let's go back to that. And in addition to that, there are add-ons, like hundreds of them, that are made by third parties that are not even on this list. And I'll show you one of those in a moment. But there are some and I'm not gonna go through all of these obviously, but there are some that I use that I recommend. And the first is this terminal and SSH. Now, a little bit of that, I'm just gonna click install, it's that simple. Um, what this does is it enables you to get at a Unix uh, terminal, okay, for Linux. It's a Linux terminal. So you can either get to the terminal directly through your home assistant um, URL right through the web browser or you can SSH into it and it's not something that you will always need to do but it is a nice feature to have and um, all I'm gonna do here is say I want to show it in the sidebar and click start and now I've got this terminal over here and when I click on that you can see it shows you a home assistant command line and I can see, you know, what's my current directory? I'm in the root directory. And I can, ls is to list the directory to show you all the contents of the directory. So these are all the, the things that are in there. So I can change to config. I can do an ls there. You can see this is where all the YAML um, files are. So this is if you ever need to dig a little deeper. It does require some knowledge of Linux. So it may not be for everybody, but this is something that I use all the time. I can't say all the time, but it's something that I recommend. All right, now you can see that's one of the other add-ons that I put in there. Now, what's some others? Um, another one is a mosquito broker. So that's an MQTT broker. I'm not gonna install it right now, but if you ever come across some device that you wanna communicate with via MQTT, you can install the mosquito broker. That one goes in really quickly as well. Duck DNS, we're gonna do that one. Um, I am gonna install Duck DNS. And I, I won't go detailed into the setup. It's not that big of a deal. You have to go on to their website and sign up. And um, I'm gonna check all of these actually. And this is where I have to put in my domain. So let me go get my domain and I'll be right back. Now I'm here on duckdns.org and it gives you a whole bunch of different ways to sign in. I'm just gonna sign in with Google. So just understand that I created a domain here and it shows my current IP address and um, I'm just gonna use this and this token that's here and I'm sorry that I have to blur all this out because it is specific to my installation. So what I'm gonna do is come over here and I just have to put in my domain Okay, I put my domain in there, and then the token I need to get from here.
and I believe that's it. All right, it's set up now. I've got my DuckDNS add-on. That is gonna come into play later when we talk about remote access. Just put a pin in that because that's a, um, an important one for us. You've heard me talk about YAML. YAML is the configuration language behind the scenes. And these days you don't really have to touch YAML that often, but it is good to have a knowledge of it, that it exists. And there's gonna be times that you're going to potentially need to pay attention to it, especially depending upon the other add-ons that you use. So one of the things that I'm gonna do is I'm looking for, here it is, Studio Code Server. So this is Visual Studio is a free platform that Microsoft developed. And it's obviously usable on Linux. It's usable on a lot of different platforms. So what this does is it, it's basically an editor on steroids and it allows you to see YAML and open those files and do editing if necessary. And, um, and it also does some um, formatting for you and things like that. That's the biggest, that's the hardest part about YAML is the fact that uh, it's very structured and the indentation has to be right and the colons and it's a whole syntax, which is kind of a pain in the neck. So they've been working for years trying to get it so that people like you and me don't need to worry about YAML. But every now and then, you might need to. So, you know, you can see I have Studio Code Server here on the side. And when you open that up, you can see here's all the config in the, in the config folder. I think I can set this to dark. Yeah. Dark. Visual Studio. Good. Okay, so I can set that to dark. And now when we go to, this is the configuration file that is config.yaml or configuration.yaml and then automations. All the automations that I created before in this video are all in here. And this is, this is behind the scenes the way they are configured. Now, in the old days of Home Assistant, you used to have to know how to code YAML, but not anymore. Now everything is through the front end. But just be aware that these things are here. Here's the scenes.yaml as well. You can see those are the two scenes that I created earlier. So anyway, it's here, and that's why I recommend Studio Code Server. All right, let's talk about backup. Now, you remember, when you're talking about a Raspberry Pi, your Achilles heel here is the SD card. These are not meant to be used as disk drives, and but that's how the Raspberry Pi uses it. So eventually, that will fail, okay? There could be other reasons why your Home Assistant might fail and you might have to restore it. So you want to back up your configuration all the time, okay, periodically. And so whether you're using a Raspberry Pi or you're using a, uh, an x86 computer, it doesn't make a difference. Even though this one has a real SSD drive in it, which is very reliable, it's still vulnerable to issues. And there may come a time through whatever glitch that you need to restore your Home Assistant configuration. So you wanna back it up. Now there's two ways that I recommend backing up. One of them is um, if you have a computer that's running all the time in your house or a NAS, you can set up a Samba share. And what that just means is that you, um, you have a shared folder someplace on your network and you can have your home assistant back up to that Samba share. The other is you can use a Google Drive. And if you don't have a computer on in the house, you can have a Google Drive and you can have it back up to the Google Drive. Now there may be others as well, but I've seen videos on how to do the Google Drive and I'll, um, I'll put a link to one of them down in the, uh, the video description below if you wanna use that route. What I'm gonna do, and I'll show you how to do it, is to set up a Samba share which because I have a NAS running in my house, I can do that. So let me come back over here. Okay, I am logged into my NAS over here and you can see I created a shared folder that I call HA Backup. And that is for my Home Assistant Backup. And I also created an HA User. And this is the only user account that has access to this shared folder. And here is the shared folder. It is empty and uh, just waiting to be used. So it's ready for me to set up 
the Samba Backup on Home Assistant. Now the Samba Backup or the Google Drive Backup, neither of those are built-in add-ons. You need to find them. You can do a search for them. I'll put a link to them both down in the video description below. But here is the Git page for this Hasio Samba Backup. Okay, and it's by this guy here, Thomas Moorer. Moore. And usually you can see whenever somebody is donating their time to basically build a plugin, not only to help themselves, but then they put it out on Git so that other people can use it like this, usually there's some way to donate to them. So, you know, they don't make any money off of it, so just be kind if you're gonna use it, just give them a couple bucks and uh, it just makes their day. And I know personally when uh, people donate to me. Anyway. This tells you for the installation, you're going to navigate to the add-on store and then you're going to add this URL. Okay, so let's take this and we're going to come back over here to these three dots and I'm going to say repositories and I'm going to add this repository. Okay, and close that. And now when I scroll down here, and now you see Tom's add-on right here, okay? the Samba backup. So now I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna install this. Now, to edit the config, IP address of my host, which is my NAS. And the share, I called HA backup. And the target directory just will be that. And the username, I called HA. There's the password, keep local all, keep remote all. I'm just gonna say keep local. How many backups do I want to keep local on the machine here? I'm going to say, uh, let's just keep two local. And the remote, I'm going to say keep 10 of them. And here I can say, well, what's the trigger time? In other words, what time of day is this going to run? I'm going to say 3 a.m. And I'm going to run it all days of the week. So every day of the week, I'm going to keep 10. I'm actually going to make this bigger because they're not very big. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep Let's say 20, no, let's do an entire month. We're gonna do 30. I'm gonna say save. So unfortunately there is no button to manually do a backup and force it to go so that I could demonstrate it to you. So I took a couple screenshots from the next day and here you can see that it successfully ran last night at 3 a.m. And here you can see the backup file on my share folder in the NAS. All right, next we're gonna talk about remote access. And to do that, I'm gonna set up the Home Assistant app on my phone. Now let me share this screen for you. Okay, now I'm in the App Store and I searched for Home Assistant and I already have it installed, so I'm going to click Open. Now, when I'm on my local network, you can see scanning for servers and it finds my Home Assistant installation. I'm just gonna click Home. I can put in my credentials here and I can log in and let's see, I'm gonna set up notifications. Okay, now you can see I have my home assistant here. In fact, I can click on, there you can see the light over here on that side of my face goes on <laughs> just by clicking those things. So that's great, they both work. So this is essentially the same dashboard that I'm seeing by default on the screen. In fact, you can see when I click that, <laughs> the, the little thing here shows up and the same thing on the screen. They both are in sync, which is great. But this topic is remote access. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off my Wi-Fi, And now, oh, I click this and nothing happens. Why is that? Well. All right, let's go back to, see this says con connected via internal URL. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna add a server. I'm gonna enter the address manually. I realized during editing that I could have entered the external URL right in this screen and I would have had two URLs, the internal and the external for the same server. It supports that. So that's what I recommend, but I'm gonna proceed the way that I did it. I'm gonna put in the domain that I created with DuckDNS. Now remember we talked about DuckDNS earlier. So that enables me to put in the domain name for my home's address. I'm connected. Now this is off Wi-Fi. Okay, 
this one I'm going to delete. Okay, now here I am connected to the same server, but I am off Wi-Fi. You can see there's no Wi-Fi indicator at the top of my phone. I'm just on my cellular LTE signal. So let's try this again. And it works. And it works in the same level of real time. I am connected directly through my firewall. Speaking of firewall, I did have to open up and do port forwarding on my firewall so that when I go to my firewall with port 8123, it forwards to my home assistant instance. That's beyond the scope of this video. Just understand that it is a step that is necessary for this to work. So now I can use my home assistant app on my phone from anywhere in the world. So that's remote access. Okay, let's talk about dashboards. So a lot of people think that dashboards are one of the most powerful features of Home Assistant. I think that's debatable because I think dashboards are only really applicable if you're sitting at your computer or some other device and looking at dashboards. They're good. I want to show you how to use them, but don't overuse them in my opinion because that's not the point. You should not be having to, they give good demo, but you shouldn't have to be sitting there to use your dashboard. Now, what you're seeing here is the home dashboard that is by default with every home assistant, and it is managed by home assistant. If I go into one of my devices and I say add to dashboard, it says you're not managing any dashboards. So let me show you the three dots up here in the corner or where you can say, I wanna edit this dashboard. Cause maybe you say, you know, this Walmart quad, this means nothing to me. What do I need these on here for? So this, I'm going to say, edit that dashboard. And it's going to say, hey, do you want to take control of your dashboards? And if you do, then it will no longer be automatically managed by Home Assistant. So remember that by default, it is automatically managed by Home Assistant. You have to come in and take control. And then when I do that, you can see this is the home dashboard, which I can click this little icon and rename it and change the icon if I want to, whatever the case may be. I can even delete this dashboard, but I can also create additional ones. So I'm going to create this one. I'm just going to call it switches. And let's see what icon should I use? All right. The light switch icon will work. All right. So there you go. Now, I'm going to add a card to it. Now, cards are these widgets that you can put on your dashboards. And you can put them in various different ways. So let's say I want to add my smart switches or my, my smart plugs to my dashboard. Now, I can do this by card if I want, or I can do it by entity. So I'm going to do it by entity because I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say, where's my smart switch six, but I want the switch one, not the light one. The light one doesn't work. It is, that's not what controls the plug itself. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the third reality and I'm going to put that one on here too. Continue. And I'm going to say, okay, great. This is the card. I'm going to add that to the dashboard. And now I've got the control of both of these lights. See, I'll switch that. Now you can see, boom, boom. Nice. So that is one card. I can do another one that is, uh, I mean, there's lots of them here, but let's say I do a weather forecast. I'm just going to show current weather and forecast. Great. Save that, add that. I can move these things around as needed. I can edit these things if I want to. Okay, I've customized the name here and I can do them just like before. You don't have to keep the device name the way that Home Assistant created it. So that's good. I like that. And then when I'm done, I click done and now I've got the home is still here, but I've also got switches. Now, another thing I can do is like even on this home one where the wall moat quad, I'm just going to say edit this dashboard and I'm going to come in here and say delete that card. I don't need to know. There you go.
I don't need that. All right, so basically that's dashboards. You can create as many dashboards as you want across the top. You can, if you notice, each one of the dashboards has a URL associated with it. So you can take any one of those, like I could take this switches and I can create a kiosk somewhere in my house that displays this dashboard. And that, that's beyond the scope of what I'm trying to do here. I just wanted to give you an overview of the fact that you, you can take control of dashboards, you can put devices on them and configure them and format them however you want. And um, yeah, that's it. Now, those of you that have watched my channel in the past know that I've had Insteon devices in my house. And about a year ago, they went out of business, but they came back. So you're probably wondering, hey, uh, we saw this Insteon hub here discovered. Aren't you going to set that up too? Well, the answer is no. After a lot of, um, you know, contemplation, I decided that I really want to get away from Insteon. Insteon is a proprietary protocol, whereas everything else in home automation is really going towards more open standards. And although Insteon is great and it, it works, definitely, I, you can't compare on the price. So for example, I got a four pack of those Zigbee smart plugs, four pack for $30, that's $750 each. An equivalent in Insteon is this on off module, it's $55. Okay. Similarly, one of the real reasons why I, I loved Insteon was these keypad dimmers. Okay. And they're really pretty cool, but they're $80 a piece. They allow me to not only control um, a device, like I have one of these in my kitchen and it can turn on and off the kitchen lights, but those other seven buttons can be used to program other scenes or other devices. So I have one for my island lights, I have one for my cabinet lights, and, and that makes it really useful to me. But guess what? There are options available. This is something you can see, I purchased this a year ago and I have yet to use it. And part of it was because I wanted to set up my uh, home assistant to see how I could use it. But this is actually a Zoos Z-Wave device that is a not only controlling a load, that big switch controls the light, but the other four buttons could be used for other things. So, and it's a lot cheaper. It's half the price. It's $40. So that's something that's on my to-do list is to actually investigate how these things work. And now that I have my home assistant set up, I'm actually, I've got a long list of products that I want to actually test with it. And I'm moving myself away from Insteon. So I apologize to any of you that are still using Insteon. Uh, not going to be able to help you out with that one. I will say that I have played with the Insteon integration and it is a lot better than it was a year ago. A year ago I tried it and it was, in my opinion, it, it, it wasn't going to do the job for me. But the way it is today, I think it's a lot better. So if you are an Insteon user, hey, I, I have great respect for that. But um, it's just I'm going in a different direction. Now there is one more feature that I intend to implement, but I did not talk about it in this video because it is a broad topic. It's going to need a video of its own. And that is the Amazon Echo integration. I use Amazon Echo in my house and um, there are instructions on how to do that. And you can see right here on homeassistant.io, there is an integration with Amazon Alex A. And, um, there is a long list of, of what you can do here. There's an easy way and there's a hard way. <laughs> the easy way, as you can see here, is to use Home Assistant Cloud. Home Assistant Cloud is also called Nabucasa and it costs $65 a year. Now, Nabucasa is the company behind Home Assistant, so they don't sell the software. It doesn't cost anything, it's free. But in order to use this integration, they do charge a monthly or an annual fee. So for $65 a year, you can go ahead and, and use this. Like I said, that is the easier approach. The more difficult approach is listed further down on this page and there's a whole slew of steps that are required to get this set up with Amazon. And it is something that I, it's on my to-do list. So leave a comment if that is something that you're interested in. And, uh, but it is something that I intend to do uh, down the road. 
So other than that, I do have some additional integrations that I plan to put in. I do have some Lutron Caseta in the house and I have some 2U devices and things like that. I'm going to play with it, but I've given you the foundation here in this video. You now know how to do integrations. They all pretty much work the same way. And um, even add-ons, they work pretty much the same way too. All of them have their own specific little quirks. All I would say is just read the directions because that's it's pretty straightforward when you do that. And just uh, feel free to play around. And as long as you're backing up your home assistant, you're not going to mess anything up. You can always restore to yesterday's backup if you screw something up. So hopefully that helps. And, um, you know, please leave me a comment down below. Let me know how you found this video, if it was useful to you, and if you did actually implement Home Assistant because of it. And if you did find anything that is incorrect, please let me know. I am going to revise this video over time. And uh, because like I said, Home Assistant continues to change. So I will come out with new versions of this every now and then. So thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.